tonight. Would you take us, uh, take your word, copy of the scripture, and turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18, and we'll go past verse 22 to verse 25. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 25. We all need a handle on things. I was watching the ringers, and I have absolutely no rhythm, and I'm always amazed at how they can ring those bells and be that in that kind of time and with those notes, but there's a handle that you grab. I remember how uh, one day I suddenly realized that I was getting to be middle-aged, though I was in my 30s. I looked down and realized I had love handles. Now, for those of you who are too young to understand that or experience that, Paul, a love handle is that fat on both sides of your waist. When suddenly you are no longer a 32 or a 30, but you are a little bigger. But I want to talk to you about a different kind of love handle. Now, you know, in this season of merriment and wonderful food, some of us have the motto, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we diet. (laughs) And I realized that when I gain weight that I could help myself more by helping myself less. But I want to talk to you not about horizontal layers of fat, but about how very practically we can get a handle on loving as Christ loves. We do horizontal loving with others because of the vertical love the Lord has for us. Here it is love not that we loved Him, but that He first loved us, John said. So let's get a handle on the real way to show love this Christmas season. And I want to share a word particularly today about loving in the family. And if you're a parent or grandparent, some of these things are going to be particularly important to you in relation to your kids. Let's stand as we read the word together and honor the inspired scriptures of the Lord. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. You may be seated. We need to take the love handle of faith. And as we have been looking at this very significant section of Scripture... The Bible uh, describes that we in Christ have been redeemed. And then it goes on to speak about this salvation experience as being born again. Born again. And it's all through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Why is it precious? There have been those through the years who have criticized Christianity as a slaughterhouse religion, a gory faith, but they don't understand the real meaning of the blood. I remember when I was in college and I went to a, a Baptist college that was leaning far to the left 
in many of the class uh, lectures and through various professors' stances on things. And I still remember a religion professor who made fun of the blood of the cross. Several of the ministerial students literally got up and walked out of the class. And I sat there and felt guilty that I had not gotten up. But I wanted to hear what he had to say so I could better disagree with him. But it was appalling that he would take lightly the blood of Jesus Christ. Why is it precious? Earlier we saw that God is the Holy One of Israel. And he says, be holy as I am holy. To be holy means to be set apart. He is the one and only God. And we can never get away from that. He is the one true God. He is in a class all by himself. There is no one like him. An oak is a tree. Earth is a planet. I am a human. A kangaroo is an animal. An angel, just think of Abraham, of uh, the archangels. Think of Michael and Gabriel, but they're angels. They are created beings. But God is God. He is the only God, the one true God, the living God. He is holy, holy, holy. And there is nothing that compares with God, no one, no person, no thing. He is uniquely valuable. And all that he does, including the precious blood of Jesus, is the most valuable thing in the universe. Diamonds are rare because uh, they, uh, we can't just find them in the road everywhere. And they're valuable because they're rare. But God is the rarest one possible. The rarest, most beautiful person in the universe was expressed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard uh, just yesterday the famous golfer, many consider the greatest of all time, Jack Nicklaus. He is auctioning off a wristwatch that he has worn for 50 years. It's a valuable Rolex, but it's made more valuable because Jack is the one who has worn it. And he's auctioning off his wristwatch for the sake of children's charities. He said that actors Steve McQueen and Paul Newman did that and raised millions of dollars. Why? Because, well, they wore it. <laughs> now, Rolex is an expensive watch. I don't have one. But their, their Rolexes are bringing in millions of dollars because someone will bid and say, I want that watch. I'll pay so much money for it. But I loved what Jack Nicholas said he, he said, it's far more fulfilling to help children than to win a tournament. It's far better to have that sense of being, uh, of loving than making a four-foot putt, he said. But you see, that watch is valuable because of someone else. The blood of Jesus is precious because it was the Lamb of God who was slain. When we come to Christmas every year, we remember the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Flesh and blood, Jesus. All God, all human. And yet they beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Why is the blood of Jesus precious? It's precious because of its time of spilling as the shed blood of Christ. Those who are more liberal actually give more importance to the blood of Jesus before he died, saying his example, his character is what matters. But it's his death for us. That's why Ephesians said, we have redemption through his precious blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let me read it exactly, Ephesians 1, 17. And it says this, that uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ has come. Excuse me, verse 7, not 17. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Do you know that forgiveness? Before I became a Christian, 
I, I did not have a sense of sin. And when the conviction came by the Holy Spirit, then I realized I am a great sinner. I've got to do something about my sin. And therefore, because Jesus died, he paid the redemption price for me. I could be set free. You know, in the Bible, there were two great pictures of forgiveness. The word generally means to send away, to put away. And in the Old Testament, there were two goats. One was slain uh, at the time of the Day of Atonement. The priest would lay his hands on that, and it was a picture of how uh, all of our sins were identified in that shed blood. But then there was a scapegoat, and again, the priest would lay hands on another goat, and they would send him out into the wilderness to be seen no more. The fact that God, when He redeems us, puts our sins as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. Wouldn't you like to know you're forgiven like that? It's all through the precious blood of Jesus. It's precious because of its source in Jesus. He had no personal sin. Uh, he was the perfect lamb who takes away the sin of the world without spot or blemish. He said, who of you convicts me of sin? That blood is precious because of its place in God's plan. God foreknew and foreordained, even before the foundation of the world, that Jesus would die, would sin, would uh, take the sins of humanity on himself. God had a plan for that blood. The Passover lamb was selected and set apart long before he actually was slain, according to Exodus chapter 12. And they held that lamb, they kept that lamb until it was time for him to be killed as a picture of how one day the Savior would come and shed his blood. But particularly the blood is precious to us because of forgiveness. Because what God does for us is give us faith and hope, as it says in verse 21. If you go out into uh, the mall or somewhere and, and you have something you've identified as very precious to buy, you're really looking for that one thing, and all of a sudden you see a sign that says 90% off. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, let's, we're pretending here a moment. <laughs> and, and you've been thinking, I've looked everywhere, and 90%, what a deal. I, when I was uh, uh, working out in Phoenix uh, in college days, I did some work in a store, and I had a Jewish boss, and he had a favorite saying. He was from New York City. Such a deal already. <laughs> Such a deal. 90% off. I want to tell you, 100% of your sins could be forgiven through Jesus Christ, his precious blood shed on the cross for you and me. And we have to take that love handle of faith. Because the Bible says we hold fast to our confession of faith. You say, Lord Jesus, you died for me. You paid for that price for me to ransom and set me free. Thank you, Lord. But secondly, take the love handle of truth. Because all of this is because we are obedient to the truth. Verse 22. Now, our culture was not built on relativism, but absolute truth. We hold these truths to be self-evident, the Declaration said. The home was held in high esteem as a sacred institution, at least in the past. There were certain things that were right and wrong. Uh, we were set free from tyranny because oppression was wrong. Taking away property of others was wrong. In other words, our nation was built on a moral standard. And for years, we held to that. But back in the 60s, there was a prophet raised up in our midst of tremendous intellectual strength named Francis Schaeffer. I have friends in our church uh, that we were in back in Florida, and uh, this particular woman 
uh, stayed in their home in Labrie, in Switzerland, and was led to faith in Christ by Francis and Edith Schaefer. But also in our church down in Florida was a, someone you know, Chuck Colson, who founded Prison Fellowship. And Chuck shared with me one time he was visiting with Francis Schaefer not long before Schaefer died. Schaefer had a passion that the United States not continue to go the way of Europe. He had watched Europe degenerate into a lack of moral clarity, uh, a, a doing away of moral absolutes because of relativism. There is no absolute truth, in other words, they said. And he said to Chuck with a weak voice, Chuck, the issue is still truth, true truth, he said, true truth. Truth that is verifiable, truth that is absolute, truth that is infallible based on the Word of God. And our great passion for our children, as John said, the old apostle in his third letter, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth, 1 John 4. True truth. And yet, because of that truth, we have obedience, therefore. We can have faith because we put our trust in someone who is reliable and someone who is true himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. G.K. Chesterton, the English uh, philosopher who became a believer, said this about our moral standards. Before you remove the fences, find out why they were put there in the first place. And so we've now removed the fences. The borders are gone in more ways than one, of course. But all those borders that said this is right and this is wrong are now relative. It's right if it's right for me, and it may not be right for you. It may be right for you, it may not be right for me. It's called relativism. And therefore, we have now, in our culture, 23% of American adults identified as nuns. Either they're atheist, agnostic, or absolutely nothing in belief. 23% according to the latest survey. Current church members of American churches, 68%... Think God accepts the worship of all religions. It, uh, as this Muslim cab driver said to me last week, uh, I, we all worship the same God. 41% of Americans believe that gender is a matter of personal choice. If I say I'm a woman, though I'm really a man, well, that means if I, if I say it and choose it, it's true. 49%... Uh, say that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion, not absolute truth. So we have nuns in our society, and uh, 72% of them are between the ages of 18 and 49. 57% of them are men in that age group. 50% of nuns with a religious background of some kind cite the reason for lack of faith now is this, three things. One, they say science and faith are incompatible, and therefore faith is irrational. They say that Christianity is too exclusive, and then they also say there are no good reasons to believe in God. But the Bible says we are to be obedient to the truth, because when we are, it is not only that we're then saved through faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood, but we have purified our souls, verse 22 says. How are you clean? How do you sense that God has forgiven you of your sins? You put your faith in what Christ has done, and the effects continue the rest of your life. Because the verb tense that is used here for have purified your souls means it was accomplished at a point in history on the cross 
with continuing results in the present and the future. Isn't that wonderful news? <laughs> to know that when Jesus said, it is finished and the debt was paid in full, when he gave his precious blood, when he died in your place, isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus' forgiveness then is still cleansing you now? Amen. We take that love handle of obedience to truth. But then third, we take the love handle of sincerity. Verse 22. Look back at with me at it for just a moment. Uh, you have purified your souls with a sincere love of the brethren. Now, the word sincere here means non-hypocritical. It was also used of actors in that day who would wear masks. And uh, the Greek and Roman actors would put on a mask to play a certain part. And the idea of sincerity was that they made judgments without wearing a mask. In other words, how they saw things is what they were. They said what they meant, they meant what they said. And therefore, God calls us to have a sincere love that is non-hypocritical. With who? The brethren. Oh, Remember the poem? Maybe you've heard it. Ah, to dwell there above with those that we love, that will be glory. But to live here below with those that we know, that's another story. <laughs> it's hard to love the brethren sometimes. Sometimes the meanest people you ever meet are in a church. Not this church, of course. And one of the things you hear, if you're a pastor, like I've been for a long time, you will hear people say, I am not doing business with one of those Christians. I'd rather pick a pagan and do business with them than one of those hypocritical Christians. God, help us for that. We're to have a sincere love for the brethren. Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Let me mention two things. There needs to be sincere acceptance in our love. And the word love that is used here is phile. It was the word for uh, affection for someone, deep friendship. It's the kind of love that says, I like you a lot. And usually it's because of what that person means to us. A Philadelphia kind of love. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.3 3, that one of the characteristics of parents in the last times, the last days closer to when Jesus comes, is that they are without natural affection. We're seeing that today, aren't we? In the rise of abortion more and more since 1973, those who would be mothers who have no affection for that child in their womb. We've seen it with increasing domestic abuse in the home. And you talk to any policeman or sheriff and they will tell you that the most dangerous time they ever face is either when they have to stop a car somewhere out on the highway or when they enter into a domestic situation in homes. Without natural affection, and that word means a hard-heartedness toward one's own kindred to not cherish affectionately. And some of you might say, well, you know, I love my kids, I just don't like them. <laughs> and and I, if you've ever had a middle schooler, or you, you know, and never mind, but uh, <laughs> it's tough being a middle schooler, isn't it? It's tough having a middle schooler. As a parent, all those changes going on, all of that struggle and all those hormones. Listen, it's a tough time. And yet God says, I want you to love that young man, love that young lady with natural affection. It's natural and normal for a Christian to love and forgive and be patient. 
It is unnatural for a Christian to not have sincere love. Because we have been obedient to the truth. We said, Lord, uh, you know the truth about me and forgave me. Surely I can love and forgive him or her. Acceptance is unconditional love. And it's where our children or our grandchildren know they can come to us with any sin, any sorrow, any question or problem or failure, and they will be loved sincerely. But it's also sincere affirmation as well as sincere affection. It means, for instance, you, what you prioritize, you verbalize. You not only say, uh, well, that my kids know I love them. You show love. You say love. When Jesus was baptized and then again on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Heavenly Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. At the beginning and toward the end of His ministry, the Heavenly Father affirmed Jesus. His Son. And God does that through us with our children. And then here's another truth about affirmation. You find what you're looking for. If you are looking for faults, you're going to find them. Uh, Let me make a suggestion. I did this with my son uh, again when he was a middle schooler. Because Evan was a handful. And we had to pray, and we would go to his bedside, and Janet would uh, claim him for the Lord, and we would pray for him. And one day, I remember, I was so frustrated with him, I was so angry, that I just got out a piece of paper, and I wrote down the things I liked about him and the things I didn't like about him. Phileo. And I found that the things I didn't like were a longer list than those that I liked. And I knew that God had to do a work in my heart as well as His. You find what you're looking for. Try to catch your kids and grandkids doing something right. Try to catch your husband doing something that's a blessing to you. Not always looking and prodding and expecting the worst. And then you strengthen what you value. You strengthen what you value. If you say, I I believe this is important, sincere love in affirmation underscores that and says, I like it, keep it up. One One of the strongest affirmations I can think of is for dads to love their daughters and their granddaughters in such a way that they model for them what one day their husbands will be like. Where they they love that girl and they believe that girl is beautiful and precious. I heard about a young lady who had a promise ring. She was wearing a, a faith promise ring. And the initials on the ring were I A. H. And her girlfriend, uh, Karen, said, you know, those aren't your initials. Uh, is, are those the initials of your boyfriend? She said, oh, no, I don't have a boyfriend. That stands for I am his. I belong to Jesus. More than not anyone else, I belong to Jesus, but one day I am saving myself in purity so that on our wedding night I can hand this ring to him and say, I have saved myself for you as well as the Lord. A faith pledge ring. And therefore, girls like that will not look for love in all the wrong places. Here's the next truth. Take the love handle of sacrifice. The Bible says fervently love one another from the heart. This is not phileo love. This is agape love. This is sacrificial love. And it's not because the pleasure that person gives to you. It's because of the preciousness of that person. Because God loves them and therefore you love them. And therefore you're willing to lay down your life for that one. That's what John 3.16 love is. 
God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. We forget that that's a Christmas verse, too. Not only that He died on the cross with His precious blood, but that God gave that Son to be born into our world that first Christmas. Sacrificial love. The kind that says, my sincere love for you is that I truly put you above myself. I love you. And my love for you is not based on your appearance or even your performance, but God's grace. We talk about Lottie Moon. Most people don't know who she was. Lottie was born Charlotte. Hey, our wonderful city, Charlotte. Charlotte Diggs Moon, 1840. She was one of the smartest women of her day. She was one of the few Southern women who actually had not only a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree in 1861. Very smart lady, even though she was only four feet, three inches tall. But as a 30-year-old, she felt called to Chinese missions and became the first single woman Southern Baptist missionary in history. She went to the poor Shantung province, and there she labored for over 30 years and particularly was burdened for the poor and particularly the women who suffered so much. She wrote countless letters to back to the states, to the foreign mission board, pleading with them to send more money to help all, all the many who are starving to death, literally. She finally was able to get a Christmas offering established. On Christmas Eve, 1888, the first Lottie Moon Christmas offering was taken. And ever since, we've given millions of dollars to international missions. But in 1912, Lottie Moon had so become malnourished and in starvation mode, giving away her food to others. The board finally presumed, uh, urged her to come home for a rest. And on the ship, she literally gave her last food to a China, Chinese woman who was starving. And Lottie Moon died. But listen to what she said not long before she did. If I had a thousand lives, I would give every one of them for the women of China. That's sacrificial love. Bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ, Galatians says. But then we take the love handle of fervency as well. Look with me in chapter 4, verse 8. Peter said, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. That's an intense, urgent sea, fervency, urgent love, active, not passive love. It's, it's love that seeks a response from someone else. We went to the Billy Graham uh, library last night. What a, what a wonderful place. My first time there ever. And the beautiful Christmas lights and trees and uh, all that the meal and all that they do there is just absolutely wonderful. And uh, yet I remember a story about Franklin. You know, Franklin Graham is the primary preacher now, leader of the Billy Graham Association. Ruth, his mother, heard a noise in the room and there was Anne, little, little Anne Graham, slapping Franklin across the face. Again and again. She said, Anne, what in the world are you doing? She said, I'm teaching Franklin to turn the other cheek. <laughs> I don't think that lesson took too well. I wonder if he slapped her back. Even evangelist kids can, you know, get off track. But the fact is, uh, we, we seek to be not bridge burners, but bridge builders. 
Not heartbreakers, but heart changers. And it's not by slapping, it's not, it's not by hurting and criticizing and attacking, it's by loving fervently, eliciting love from someone else because we love them. Romans 12, 18 always stands out to me as a principle to follow. Listen to this. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing... You will, be, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's why the great inventor Booker T. Washington said this, I will not allow any man to make me lower by hating him. I will not lower myself by coming down to his level. Fervent love. It's active love. It's love that doesn't just say, I think people ought to come to church. It's love that invites them to come. It's love that shares the Bible. It's love that brings them to the concert. It's love that gives to missions. And one last thing. Take the love handle of transformation by the Word. And you see that in verses 23 to 25. We're born again. Literally, that's born from above. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be completely changed. Now, we've we've been called as evangelicals born-againers. How many have heard that term, born-againers, right? And and you know, it's, it's kind of derogatory, isn't it? They think we're a few fries short of a happy meal. But it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be born again, to be changed. And it comes when the Word, the, the seed of the Word is implanted in our hearts. And then that seed bears fruit. Without faith, we cannot be redeemed and saved. But without the Word, the hearing of the Word brings faith, the Bible says. So you hear that Word. That Word is living. It's dynamic. This is not a dead book. It's as applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago. It's enduring. Scholars may debate it. Educators may ban it from the classroom. Business people may forbid it to be on an office desk. Dictators may burn it, but the Bible is forever. The flower does not fade like grass or dead flowers. I mentioned Billy Graham. I had the privilege of hearing him preach back in 1963 in Phoenix at a crusade. My uh, Presbyterian friend Don wanted to go, and so I said, Don, I'll go with you. And then he wanted to go forward down uh, in the invitation. I said, well, I'll go with you. The counselor came to me and not to him. He said, do you want to make a decision? I said, no, I brought my friend. He really needs it. He's a Presbyterian. (laughs) I was a Baptist. But I was a lost Baptist. And I was not led to Christ then. But I was so struck, I looked up, and we were right under the platform. And I looked up, and there was Mr. Graham. And something in my heart was drawn to him, as so many millions of others have been. And I saw in him the Lord. And he kept saying, the Bible says, the Bible says. And so after that crusade, I got my little Bible that I'd never read. And I, tried, I just picked a book at random and I picked James. It didn't make any sense to me. It's, it's the simplest book in the New Testament. And I didn't understand it because the author did not live in my heart. And some years later, after I'd become a Christian at 15, and then as a, about a 32-year-old, the Lord allowed me to lead in prayer to Graham Crusade and to meet the great man himself. And sitting on the platform with Franklin and Amy Grant and Billy Graham 
And I got to meet him before, and it was like, it was, I was so overwhelmed by my unworthiness and his godliness, I could hardly look him in the eye. But I told him that story about that crusade years before. And that God had used what he simply said about the Bible to put me on a search to be able to hear and know and that I was finally born again. And the Lord will use this today. The word has been preached to you. Would you get a handle on it? Let's bow our heads in prayer, please.